Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our daily Design Innovation Month webcast. Uh, my name is Chris Dubuque. I'm one of the application engineers with Computer Aided Technology. And uh, I'm going to be here just assisting today's presenter, and that is Robert Warren, one of our simulation product specialists, also with Computer Aided Technology. Uh, before we get into the uh, presentation, I'll just go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, number one, all of our webcasts are recorded and we will upload them to the CATI YouTube channel. Uh, give us a couple of days to process the video and get it uploaded. I will also send a link out in the WebEx chat with the address of the uh, CATI channel. Because we record our webcasts, I have everyone's audio muted and I ask, please keep yourselves muted because any background information will get picked up by the recording and it will be part of that video that gets uploaded to YouTube. So if you have any type of WebEx questions, issues, please use the chat. Uh, you can filter me out or, or chat to everyone. I'm listed as CATI in the participant list and uh, I'll do what I can to help you. And I believe with all of that said, I will pass the presentation over to Robert. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. Welcome uh, for to joining us for the DI event um, webinar. So today we want to talk a little bit about mesh types and their proper proper usage in SOLIDWORKS simulation. But before we get into that, I just wanted to kind of lay some groundwork and kind of cover what is SOLIDWORKS simulation, kind of what to expect and where the mesh plays a role. So when we're talking about SOLIDWORKS simulation, this is our finite element analysis software. So this allows us to do structural analysis. And essentially you take a continuous body and you divide it up into elements. And this is called discretization. And this is when you actually generate a mesh. That's what you see there in the middle. So complex equations are actually solved across that mesh to give us outputs like stress, strain, and displacement. And today what I wanted to really cover was the different techniques of generating a mesh and how to use all of those techniques together uh, to, to come up with a, a proper mesh. Where do we want to go? I want to talk a little bit about just some housekeeping with regards to the models. So we're going to talk about model interference, why you don't do not really want to have that in your model uh, when using SOLIDWORKS simulation or any FEA software. Talk about different geometry classifications and appropriate mesh types. Mesh considerations. We're going to look at each one of the classifications individually, and then we're going to use them all together. And then finally, new for 2020 is something that SOLIDWORKS calls a hybrid mesh. So I wanted to kind of show that what happens behind the scenes with regards to the, to the hybrid mesh. When it comes to model interference, this is something that we do not want in our model when we're doing a, an analysis, especially when we go to generate the mesh. So what ends up happening is if you have interference in your model, you're probably going to get a warning like this that comes up, says at least two bodies are interfering. Do you want to check interference? If you say yes, it's actually going to put you into interference detection. If you say no, it's just going to tell us, hey, we've, we've got some issues um, right, with regards to this. So what I want to do is just kind of walk you through why we may not want interference and kind of how to check for that. So if we look, we have this model. It's kind of two cast pieces with a couple of pins uh, in this. And if we look at it uh, inside a sim, we've got all these individual parts. We've got a fixed hinge on either side here. We've got a force, you know, on the top. And when we go to mesh this, what we're going to see is it's going to give us that, that interference warning. So I'm just going to tell it, hey, go ahead and mesh this. What ends up happening is it says, hey, we've got two bodies here. Sometimes that doesn't always come up, but a lot of times you'll get this, right? Um, you had a part fail. And nine times out of ten, uh, it's because there's some interference in the model. So if we want to, we can say yes, check for interference. It's going to come up and say, hey, we had some, some uh, mesh creation failure. And it talks about refining some of those areas, maybe looking at mesh failure diagnostics. But if we say OK there, it takes us into the interference detection. This is the same interference detection that's on DIRT Evaluate. I'm going to go ahead and say Calculate. And what you're going to see is it actually comes up. And we have four interferences here. I pur purposely put these in the model uh, just to show this. But 
the only time that you really would want interference in a model when you're doing FEA is if you have a shrink fit condition or a press fit type condition. So if these were actually pressed into you know, these arms, this would be okay, but you would have to use a specific shrink fit contact condition. And if we look at that, it's over here. And what that does is it says, okay, we've got this press fit. We're going to make one of the parts expand, the other one contract based on the elastic modulus, and then everything is kind of kosher uh, with the mesh. However, if we try to mesh this now, it's going to throw a fit, right? And the reason being is if we look here, we've got this interference. We kind of have this double layer. SOLIDWORKS meshes apart, or any FEA mesh, meshes uh, parts in an assembly. What it tries to do is it tries to align components of the mesh together so that it can pass the information from one part onto the next. So just kind of a general housekeeping rule of thumb, you do not want to have interference in your model when, uh, when starting an analysis in SOLIDWORKS simulation. So with that kind of in place, let's go ahead and look at different geometry classifications and the appropriate meshes uh, that go along with those. So the first one is going to be what we would call as bulky. So geometry that has a width, length, and height are very similar uh, in, in size. And when you generate a mesh or you discretize a bulky uh, piece of geometry, um, oh, let me take a step back. So we have bulky and then we have thin. So thin is something more along the lines of like sheet metal, um, you know, maybe a pane of glass, uh, maybe a really thin, you know, uh, piece of aluminum, like a sheeting of aluminum that would be thin. Uh, geometry and thin has a thickness or a width that's very small in comparison to the length or the height. And then the third classification of of geometry that SOLIDWORKS looks at is a beam, so SOLIDWORKS simulation. So this would be anything that was created with a weldment uh, structure. So any I beams, C channels, anything that has a constant cross section. So when SOLIDWORKS looks at geometry, when you generate that, it doesn't matter how you generate it. When you get into SOLIDWORKS simulation. Simulation looks at these three types and then classifies the geometry from there. With regards to bulky, this is the first place or the first stop that we're going to go. So think of it like a brick. So width, length, and height are very similar. And what ends up happening is this generates a solid element. It's called a tetrahedral element. So it's this um, tetrahedral shape and is linked by these edges. And at the corners of those edges are things that are called nodes. And this is essentially where the calculation takes place. So for a draft quality element, it has corner nodes. So in the corners of the element, that's where the calculation takes place. So if you imagine that you fix those bottom spheres or those bottom nodes, and you put a force to the left on that top node, what would end up happening is all of the edges of the element would move, and they would move in a very linear fashion, right? High quality elements add something that's called as mid side nodes. And mid side nodes allows that edge to essentially bend. That's why it's called a high quality element, is it gives a better de description of how that would bend if again we fix those bottom those bottom elements or those bottom nodes and then put a force on the side of it. So that's a quadratic equation now that defines how that edge bends and it's a, a better uh, option. Now, the reason that we have draft quality is draft quality runs faster. So the more nodes there are, the more equations need to be solved. The more equations that need to be solved, the longer it takes to run. So draft quality exists when you're running a very large analysis and you just need quick results to kind of verify, hey, everything's moving how we would expect it to. And then later you get into a high quality, um, uh, essentially from there. With regards to that, let's take a look at how the 3D mesh uh, behaves. Back in the SOLIDWORKS, we have a study uh, that is started here. And with this, again, we have our parts. We have uh, our four parts. Parts, we have a fixed hinge. We're pulling up on this with 5,000 pounds. And when we go to mesh this, I'm going to go ahead and say create mesh. What it's going to do is it's going to put us in automatically to a solid mesh or a 3D uh, element. Now we have different 
options with regards to this and we have several videos on our YouTube channel that go into detail on the difference between standard curvature and blended curvature. My recommendation is stick with standard to start with. If you have very curvy geometry, try curvature based out. Uh, blended curvature is kind of a last resort. It's kind of a mix in between standard and curvature, but standard mesh tries to put the same element size everywhere in the model. When I go ahead and generate the mesh here, what you see is it generates. And what we're looking for is we're looking for at least one high quality element or two draft quality elements across any given thickness. So what we see here is we have one high quality element across this, this given thickness. Now notice that where these elements come together, those nodes are actually shared. Compatible mesh. And what it does is it says, okay, everything lying on one surface is the same as on, on another surface. So it generates uh, that geometry. Now if I look at a mesh quality plot, we can look at things here like aspect ratio or, or the mesh itself. And if I go in and I turn on mesh sectioning, what this is doing is it's essentially taking a section view of the mesh, but it's also allowing us to see kind of how the elements were generated on the inside. And this gives us a good feel for how those kind of move between them. And if we look, this edge here is where that uh, inside pin kind of, or that tube kind of meets with the arm. And you can see how those elements are shared across there. That's a good, uh, a good view of that. So again, your mesh is very well geared towards bulky geometry. So things like this, these solid pins. And an indicator of whether it's going to be or a solid mesh, a shell mesh, or thin mesh, or a beam mesh is this icon right here that's next to the parts in a parts tree. So this one looks like a bulky block that indicates that it is in fact going to be uh, going to be bulky. Next uh, geometry type that we looked at was the thin uh, geometry. So a thickness that is drastically different than the length or the height. And again, this is really geared towards sheet metal, um, you know, real thin sheeting that you might be using, panes of glass, um, you know, cardboard boxes, things, things along those lines. Now, when you're talking about thin geometry, SolidWorks uses what is called a shell mesh. And a shell mesh, very similar to a tetrahedral or a solid mesh, has a draft quality that has corner nodes and a high quality which has mid-side nodes. The difference here is it is a single thickness. You virtually tell the software how thick the part is and it understands that across uh, the given thickness. So let's take a look at how a shell mesh behaves. So the first thing that I want to look at here is I actually have a sheet metal part. Um, you know, it has a given thickness with regards to this. And if I were to mesh this as a solid, which I have already done, what you're going to see here is we're going to end up with a, a decent amount of nodal points uh, with regards to this. And, and the reason for that is, right, I want roughly two cells. In this case, it's one cell across that given thickness, right, as a high quality element. And if we right click on the mesh, we can look at the details of that mesh. And it gives us an idea of how many nodes are in, are in the mesh itself this out here. So we're looking at about 40,361 nodes. Now with respect to that, that's actually 120,000 equations that are being solved because every node carries with it three degrees of freedom. Now if we look at this and we look at the results, so let's say the uh, displacement result with regards to this. I've got a side load pushing in on it. I've got it fixed at the top and we're seeing 0 0.062 inches of displacement. And that's with a solid mesh, and a pretty refined uh, solid mesh. Uh, just to kind of give you a comparison here. Now again, this is a single part, but we can look at the solver messages. And with the solver messages here, it ran in two seconds. So that's still very quick, and I understand it's a single part. But what I want to do is I want to show you the comparison as doing this as a shell. Now one of the benefits of sheet metal inside of SolidWorks and SolidWorks simulation is because it's automatically generated as a shell. 
So you see this icon here, it no longer looks like that bulky block, it looks like a bent part. And the indicator there is that this is now a shell mesh. If we edit the definition of this, we can see that the thickness actually carried over from the sheet metal part. So we do not have to define that, but this is where we can define, you know, if we manually create a sheet metal part, which we'll do here in a minute, or a shell mesh, uh, which we'll do here in a minute, this is where you can assign that. Now, the other thing with this is if I show the mesh, it's going to look drastically different than before, right? And this is a very thin piece of geometry. It, it's essentially a surface, it's a mid surface. The other thing is if I look at the details of the mesh, we went from 40,000, right, on the solid mesh uh, number of nodes to now 12,746. So this is should solve faster than the solid mesh. If we look at displacement, we can see our displacement is 0 0.062, so almost dead on what it was with the solid mesh. And if we look at the summary with regards to the solver messages, it solved in one second. So again, it's a single part. It's not that big, but you can see it was a one second difference. You can imagine on a lot larger part how that would drastically affect this or even in an assembly. So that's a sheet metal example. That's one way of getting a shell uh, entity. I have another example, and what this is, is it's a kitchen faucet. I'm going to go ahead and look at this, you know, on a cross section, just kind of discuss it a little bit. And, you know, how this was created with, was a series of uh, revolves and sweeps and things like that to kind of come up with this geometry. But it is very, very thin. So one of the things that we can do is we can actually create the shell by the geometry right inside of Sim. So if we go back into the simulation study, you can see that this is actually generated as a solid. It's coming up as a solid. To put two uh, cells across that given thickness or even one high quality cell, we're gonna make that cell count really large. Uh, the nodal count will go up even more. And that's really not the best way to solve this. So one of the things that you can do is if you right click on the solid body, you can say define shell by selected faces. Now there's a couple things that come along with this. One is notice it puts us exactly into where we were before with regards to um, the sheet metal component. But here we're actually giving it a thickness. In this case, it's one millimeter thick. I'm going to come down here. I, I kind of cheated a little bit. Everything is tangent, so I'm going to select that outside face so it picks up everything. And one of the things that I highly recommend is doing a show preview. And when you're defining the shell here, one thing to keep in mind, I selected that outside face, but the offset is always a mid-plane, which means it's putting half a millimeter to the outside of that face and half a millimeter to the inside. So you need to adjust the offset so that everything is to the inside or to the outside when you're defining it by a face. And the reason for that is then your geometry doesn't grow uh, a little bit larger, you know, with regards to the part. From there, we now have our shell defined. Um, we can go ahead and create the mesh for this. And what you're going to see is when we uh, generate the mesh, we now have that thin uh, section for the mesh itself. When you go ahead and apply the loads, the key to this is that you apply the loads to the face that generated the shell. Okay, so because I picked the outside face, that's where I want to put my load. That's where I want to put my fixture. So those are two ways that you can go in and generate shell geometry or thin geometry uh, with regards to the model. Lastly, the third type of geometry is the beam uh, element. And with regards to this, SOLIDWORKS looks at it using the beam equations. So the, the equations that we're used to using in uh, or doing by hand, that's what you're going to see here with the beam equations and in, in the beam geometry inside of simulation. Now what this does is it generates a beam element, and that runs down the neutral axis of the beam. So it really is just nodes, so points in space connected by an edge. And that's something that's very hard to see on the screen. So how that's represented is actually represented when it meshes as a cylinder. And that's what we kind of want to, want to look at uh, with regards to this. So if I go back into SOLIDWORKS, we have geometry that was created using a weldment. So for the weldment, right, we have an underlying sketch. Uh, you come up to your weldments command, and we put a, a structural member across that sketch. Automatically trims in areas that we need it. Well, what that does is that actually lets it, lends itself 
to use as beam elements inside of simulation. So what we see here is we see a number of these and they all look like I-beams and that's the indicator that SOLIDWORKS automatically brought this in as a beam element. Now you don't have to solve this as a beam element if it came over that way because that's how it was generated in SOLIDWORKS. You simply can just right click and say treat as solid and then it puts you into a solid mesh or you could define it by as a shell and give it a you know thickness throughout that but in general the beam is the best way to go when it's a well bent type uh, geometry the loads for this are a little bit different than how the loads are handled for a shell or a solid mesh and the reason for that is when this meshes it really is just along the neutral axis of the beam so you can tell the software a couple things either put the load across the entire beam, which is what was done here, or you can put it on this thing that is called a joint. In joints, if we look here and I show these, let me edit this. So joints are these small pink uh, spheres. And those small spheres are where the elements come together. So if you have joining beams coming together, it gives you a pink sphere. If you have a beam that just terminates into uh, essentially nothing or into a solid, uh, that gives you a gold sphere. So those are where you can assign your fixtures. So in this case, when, if we look at my fixtures, I have it on all three of these joints, right? Where this kind of held to maybe the ceiling. And then for my load is across the entire beam. And if we look at the results for this, what you can see is it's displayed as a cylinder, which rightfully so, if we look at the mesh, that's how the mesh uh, looks. Now there is an option, if we edit the mesh, um, to go in here and say render beam profile. And what that does is it makes this look like the beam. So instead of you know, a tube, now it looks like the actual beam profile itself. There are some graphic issues on my machine where it's not uh, picking up that full radius here for the, for the mesh. But when we look at the results with regards to beams, we are looking at beam specific results. So in here, right, we can look at things like axial and bending stress, bending in the direction one, bending in direction two, shear stress in direction one, direction two, and so forth. And then we can also render the beam profile with regards to this as well. So if we look at displacement um, and we edit this, we can do render beam profile. And what that does is it now makes it look like the beams and it gives us an indication of how much this is uh, essentially displacing. At all three different types of geometry, the appropriate meshes that go along with those, but rarely do we ever have an all beam case or an all shell case or an all uh, solid mesh type case. So with regards to that, what I want to talk about here is a mixed mesh uh, consideration. So when we bring all three of these together, what do we have to kind of look at? What do we have to understand when using all three uh, together? So the part that we're going to be looking at is this one here on the right. So it's a frame. On the bottom, we've got these kind of solid um, feet that the rest of the beams are going to have to be tied to. We have a sheet metal cover that goes over top of it. And we're going to assign 500 PSI to the sheet metal component, and we're going to fix uh, those feet. And some of the things that are very important when dealing with a mixed mesh is checking for interference. So just like on an individual part, or sorry, on an assembly or a multi-body part, you have to check for interference. Interference is important with a mixed mesh as well. Even though the nodes are for a beam are along the center, if that runs through a solid component, you're going to have interference as virtual interference. The other thing to keep in mind is contacts, right? How those parts interact with each other. So between a beam and a shell or a beam and a solid, we have to define those, otherwise they're not going to see each other. Assign your loads accordingly, right? So for the beam is to the joints for the entire beam. For your shells, for your sheet metal, it's gonna to be to the sheet metal component. And then the same for the fixtures um, as well. So if we look at this model and kind of some of the considerations with this, this is a multi-body part. So this was done as a weldment. However, if we look at the cut list, right, these bottom feet are solids. That underlying um, frame is done as a weldment. 
And then this is actually a sheet metal component that was put over top of the frame. When we go into our study, what you're going to see is this mixed mesh environment. So the very first one here is a solid, it's that bulky indicator. Next one down, these are beams, right? We have another solid, which is one of the feet. And if we scroll all the way down, we have a shell which is indicated by that sheet metal shell uh, icon here to the left of my cursor. We can uh, look at the joint group as well, so we can see how those joints all are put together. Notice that we have a gold sphere here for the end joint, which is an indicator, hey, it's terminating. It's not terminating into another beam. It's actually terminating into a uh, solid. So. One of the considerations, right? We don't have any interference in this. That's how I made it. But for 2019, we can now do interference detection on multi-body components. So that would be a suggestion that I would have, you know, uh, before jumping into a, a simulation. The next thing, though, is we need to tell the software how these parts are going to be interacting with each other. And one of the things that I did here was between the bonded edge of the beam and the component here, get back into SolidWorks, apologize about this. The beams in the, in the uh, end of the end of the beam in the solid, you have to define a contact between that joint. So you actually pick the joint sphere, you pick the solid, and then from there, what you end up doing is assigning that, uh, assigning that contact. This loads here, we'll take a look at that. Text right here, so I did a bonded contact between the end joint and the face of the solid. So I did that for all four of those. And then I also added a contact for the beams to the sheet metal component. So if we hover over top of that, that's between the entire beam and the sheet metal component. Now you can do joints, right? So same way that we did joints for the feet, you can do joints for the beams that are lying along a sheet metal component. The problem with that is if the joints are just at the ends and you put a force on those or a pressure, the sheet metal doesn't see the rest of the beam. It only sees where the joints are. So the important thing here is between the frame and the sheet metal components, going ahead and picking the entire, the entire beam and then the shell. Uh, fixtures were added to the feet. So those were done at the bolt holes, right, or actually to the bottom of the face. And then a pressure was assigned uh, to the top face of this. Now, if we look at the mesh, let me show the mesh on this. A mixed mesh. So we can see these components were meshed as a solid. We have the beam elements of the uh, structure. And then we also have the shell elements of the sheet metal. Contacts are important, no interference is important. How the loads are applied is very important. When it comes to looking at stress displacement, with regards to stress, you can look at two sets of results. One set, and it's under the same plot, is with the solids in the beams. So we're looking at von Mises stress, or in this case, it's the normal stress. So let's switch it back to von Mises here. So this is the von Mises stress on the um, components down here, as well as on the sheet metal component. Notice that the beam profile, even though we are only really meshing that end point, is transferred, right? So that profile of the beam is actually transferred to the solid. It's also transferred to the sheet metal component. And you can see that because this is actually bending down and around where those beams are. So SOLIDWORKS does a, a good job of taking that into consideration and understanding you know, the, how those profiles are, are relayed. Now, with regards to beams, if we turn that on, we can see axial bending shear stress on those components. So you're really looking at two sets of results when you're doing a mixed mesh, the ones for the beams and then the ones for the solids and the shells. Now, unlike stress, with regards to displacement, Displacement is the same whether you're looking at shells, solids, or beams. 
And in this case, what we see here is the overall resultant displacement of the components. We're talking about a mixed mesh. Again, interference is a big one, but the contacts loads in the fixtures are really the, the important portion of that. Let's talk a little bit about the hybrid mesh. Now this was added for 2020 and the hybrid mesh is used in assemblies only. So that right now this cannot be part of a multi-body part. It has to be done with an assembly. It reduces the number of, of degrees of freedom. And by doing that, what we're able to do is actually assign draft quality meshes in, to certain parts and high quality meshes to other parts. Um, on the actual display itself, on the screen, what you'll see is whatever is draft quality is actually going to show up with an orange outline to the mesh. Whatever is high quality is going to show up with a blue outline to the mesh. The other aspect of it is those little pyramid shapes, and they're actually triangles, um, or actually they're pyramids even with the shells. Those are the indicators of whether or not they're high or draft as well. So if we look here, the ones that kind of have a squiggly edge, those are an indicator that ha that, that has a mid-side node. Anything with the sharp edge, right, the linear edge, that is a draft quality. So what I want to do is kind of show you that in a model here and actually talk a little bit about a consideration that's happening behind the scenes that you don't have to worry about, which actually makes it pretty nice. Here is a fairly simple model, just a block and then another part kind of looks like an S. I just wanted to make sure I had some uh, you know, different shape that was assigned. So if we come in here and we look, we see this indicator with both of these has the kind of squiggly edges. So that's indicating that both parts are high quality, it means that they have mid-side nodes. What I did was I fixed the bottom face. I put a 100-pound force pushing down on the top of this. And if we look at the mesh, so let me show the mesh here, it's all showing up in blue, which is an indicator it's all uh, a high quality mesh. The other thing is, and this happens by uh, default, is these are compatible. Remember I said, essentially between the two parts, they're mapped together. Well, what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna hide one of these, and then I'm gonna hide my mesh and show it. And what this will show you is how those are mapped. So if I kind of look at this and I kind of zoom in on it, you can see the outline of that S shape. What that means is every node that's on the bottom face of the S is the same as the node and element on the top face of this block. Consideration when you're doing a high quality mesh is generally by default that is um, what we call as compatible what that means is that it shares between those two. Now, in order to do a draft quality or mixed draft quality in between there, we use something that's called incompatible. And incompatible means that the two parts don't really match up mesh-wise, but they do have an algorithm behind the scenes that allows the force to transfer from one component to another. So if we look here at the displacement, right, uh, it's quite a bit of zeros. It's not a lot of force for these steel components. They're fairly thick we can see the displacement uh, right of that guy. Now, for the draft quality, all that I did was I right-clicked on the component and I said apply as draft quality. In this case, because it is draft quality, it's saying apply as high quality. So we select on the individual part and say, or group of parts and say apply as draft quality or apply as high quality. And again, this becomes a hybrid mesh as soon as you do that. Now, let me show you the mesh. So anything that is in orange, again, is draft quality. Anything that is in blue is high quality. The difference with this, and let me hide that S-shaped uh, part again. Let me hide the mesh. The mesh. What you're going to see is there's no overlay. There's no shared nodes between the two. So this incompatible um, algorithm that takes place behind the scenes that allows the two parts to essentially be meshed independently that gets turned on automatically when you make one of the parts uh, draft quality versus high quality. So I just kind of wanted to show you that and show you that that was uh, what was happening behind the scenes. So let's go ahead and look at the results here. And what we can see is they're very, very similar results, right? A bunch of zeros and a two. So with regards to 
how accurate between the hybrid mesh, which is using draft quality and high quality in between, and then using uh, all high quality, the results are very, very similar, right? We've got a, a good history of using that bonded um, mortar bonded algorithm that allows us to transfer from incompatible components. The nice thing here is if you have a really large assembly, let's say you have a trailer and you're really, really only concerned with the subframe, a couple of components on the subframe, but you really need the whole trailer to do maybe like a twist analysis. The nice thing is the bulk of the geometry can be done as a draft quality, right? We're still going to get a displacement output. You're still going to be able to twist the trailer, but you really are only concerned with a couple of the cross members in the subframe. Those are what you would do as a high quality. It's going to keep your nodal count down. It's going to allow it to run a lot faster and really give you a good, um, good output as far as the you know stress strain and displacement. So that was new for 2020. These indicators right beside the components of high quality or draft quality, as well as the fact that the the mesh is now is either all blue or all orange or a little bit of both. So that was new for 2020. So just kind of wrap up here, kind of what we went over. Bulky geometry, again, that's your solid geometry, relies on a tetrahedral mesh, and those can be in a draft or high quality. Your thin geometry uh, relies on a shell mesh, um, and again, that's just one surface. That comes in a high quality and draft quality element as well. And your beam mesh relies on essentially, a, a or your beam elements, or your weldment components rely on a beam mesh uh, to do that, and those have nodal points that lie along the neutral axis of the beam itself. Those only come in one quality. Really, 99% of the problems that are out there uh, that I've seen that I've worked on that you know I've seen from customers as well, they are a, a true mixed mesh environment. So what that means is using beams, shells, and solids, this bulky, thin, uh, and beam, you know, weldment type geometry together to get an efficient mesh and, and accurate results out of that. And again, the biggest thing with that is the context, how the parts interact, and then properly assigning the forces and loads uh, with regards to that. So that is looking at the different types of meshes, how to utilize those for your different pieces of geometry. And I thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Really appreciate that. Uh, I don't know about you, but personally, I love the new hybrid meshing in 2020. I think that's going to be one of those super, super useful uh, enhancements. Uh, thank you to, to all the attendees.